Turn with us tonight to Matthew chapter number 5. A few verses to read. Matthew chapter number 5. We'll begin at verse number 10 and read down through verse number 12. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 10 is where we'll begin. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Father, open our heart to this word. Show us in this truth Christ, and may we see ourselves too. May we recognize God, though we may not be the persecuted now. And we understand that there are persecuted in this world and that we may not always be those that miss it. We pray for your direction and instruction. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I think that this is a subject we need to be careful in and though we live in a country where for the last 200 years religious freedom has been defended, it may continue that way for a while. I, I don't know the future. I don't know if truly religious freedom is at jeopardy or it is not. Uh, but I can tell you that there's many that would like for anything religious to have no right at all. It's estimated, as I was doing a little bit of research about persecution, uh, this is certainly not, I wouldn't say factual, but as I gathered the information, uh, it staggered me to just to read the millions of people. It's estimated that there are as many as 30 million people today that are persecuted. Now, We've got to be clear about that because not everyone that is persecuted is persecuted for Christ, right? You can, you can place under the category of persecution all kinds of things, any kind of injustice socially, racially, whatever you want to do, you can throw that in there and say, I'm persecuted because of this or because of that. And uh, I want to be clear that Jesus made no promise to anyone but to those who are persecuted for him. Amen. You might have a cause and you may suffer persecution for that cause, but if that cause has nothing to do with Christ, all bets are off. I have no assurance that I can give you. But I can tell you that if you suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ, you have a God in heaven that is behind you. And that's extraordinary. What he, what he is fixing to declare, and I hope I can share, I hope this sticks with us. And I pray that we teach it. We teach it to our children, to our grandchildren, the importance of standing firm, according to the scripture, unmovable, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I pray that we be a people that are not afraid of persecution, and ready to stand for Christ no matter the cost. Um, I, I do want to say that just because America currently has religious freedoms does not mean that there aren't many, many thousands of people today that suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. And uh, this one has truly humbled my heart, and I have found myself... In the back of the bus, all the way, as I push forward those who deserve the honor, because I have not suffered. But there are many that have and do. 
And so I want to be clear. I am not in that category. And though I don't worship those people, I honor them today because they have suffered bravely. And courage and the Spirit of God have willingly stood for Christ and paid the price. And for that, I give them honor today. And we need to teach this to our children. It's a foreign concept to our children. So they've lived in a country where they've been free of this, and yet I fear that regardless of whether or not we have religious freedoms, they will suffer persecution because they take a stand for Christ. It's already happening, right? A kid wears a, a T-shirt to school that says something about Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, they're, they're taken to the office because they violated a, a dress code of some sort. There's all kinds of things of that nature that go on. Now, I don't necessarily want to put those in the category of those who suffer blood, right? Who truly are in a great grievous... But still, that within itself is persecution. And I'll help us that with definitions here in just a second. But I believe this is an important one. And I think as a congregation, albeit small... We need to grab this, and we need to recognize the importance of it. Um, I don't know what it'll cost us, but uh, I do believe God won't fail us when it comes time, or if we ever stand in a place where truly persecution is present, I believe the Spirit of God will be present more. I do not believe it will fail us in the moment we need Him most. And though some of you, even at this time, are worried or concerned or fearful that you wouldn't be able to handle persecution. Let me assure you, the best thing you can do is keep your heart right with God. And if you're right with God, here's what I can assure you. In your time of need, He will be there. You will be no different than the Apostle Paul, who at the very moment when he had to step forward and lay his head on the block, I believe he did so willingly. You say, where does that kind of strength and courage come from? It wasn't Paul's. It was his. He will not fail us. That's what this promise is about. Is reminding us that regardless of the price we have to pay, he will not fail us. Blessed are the persecuted. For righteousness' sake. In, in verse number 11, he said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, there were two different things. One is for righteousness' sake, which basically is standing for the things that are right. Right? If we continue to take a stand for Christ, there will be people that come against us. Right? They're out there. They're hunting for those easy targets. They're trying their best to find ways in so that they can persecute and create and cause trouble within the church or, or anywhere. But when it comes right down to it, what he said was, is if it's for righteousness sake, and you say, what does that mean? I want you to know that if the word of God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And we needn't be ashamed or afraid to say that it's wrong. We need to be careful and, and asking daily for the courage to stand and be light in a world that is dark. Now, if, if you'll help us when we get into verse 13 through 17, we have to address that subject. The responsibility of being salt and light in a world that is dark and needs it. But the recognition that persecution will come. Jesus never did say that we wouldn't have persecution. As a matter of fact, he was very clear in declaring that the world hated me and it will hate you. It hated what I said and it will hate what you say. And all of these things can bring persecution to you and I. And what Christ is saying is blessed are those who are persecuted. Verse number 11, it, it gives three different categories of persecution. One, it simply says persecution. One is, is concerning slander, and the other is being reviled. 
And I want us to look at those so that we clearly understand what persecution is and what persecution is not. There are a lot of things that uh, we want to throw into the category of persecution which simply isn't persecution. But let's look at number one, persecution. What does that mean to be persecuted? I have a definition tonight and I think it's accurate. It says to be harassed or punished in a manner designed to injure, grieve, or afflict, to make one suffer because of their beliefs. To be persecuted is to be harassed or punished in a manner designed to injure, grieve, or afflict. Number two, reviled. Jesus said, blessed are you when they shall, when men shall revile you for my sake. Reviled means to subject one to verbal abuse, to ridicule or curse one due to their beliefs. Verbal abuse. Number three, slander. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Slander. The definition to utter the utterance of false charges or lies which defame and damage another's reputation. So we have persecution which can involve injury, grief, or affliction, reviling, which is being verbally abused for one's belief, and then slandering is truly false charges or lies brought against you because of your affiliation with Christ. Persecution, being reviled, and being slandered. What Jesus said is, blessed are you. When any of these things occur, now, obviously, to the flesh, we're, 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 we're saying, well, this can't truly be what he meant by this statement, but it is. It is clear, it's simple, and it's something we need to try to spin in a different way. When he said, blessed are you when these things occurred, that is absolutely what he meant. You are fully satisfied when you are persecuted, reviled, and slandered. It goes against everything that our flesh believes, everything that our flesh considers as right or peaceful or easy or, or any of these things that we might consider to be blessed. What Jesus said is, blessed are you when you are persecuted. Now, the reason we don't truly understand this truth is because we have experienced so little true persecution. We have never been to the place where we were grievously injured because of our affiliation with Christ. Maybe verbally abused here and there, maybe falsely accused, but likely mostly not. Um, you know, Steve, as he went into the jails, may have been attacked in some way or another, I don't know. But, but I tell you, we face very little persecution because, at least in theory, we have religious freedom in this country and it's protected us from such. We, we have, at least at this point in our, in our country, an opportunity or at least the right to go to law if it takes it, if someone abuses us, slanders us, or afflicts us simply because we believe in Christ. Now, it may or may not always be that, and it may also get to the point in this country where people don't care what the Constitution says or what the law says. If they, if they feel truly that it's a cause worth dying for, they'll persecute you because of their cause alone. But what Jesus said was, I want you to know that you're going to be blessed when you experience such things. I think this takes us into, a, I'm not assuming here, I'm simply going by what Scripture says. When Peter and John went and they were preaching the gospel and the Sanhedrin drew them in and accused them and and told them to quit preaching it. And the Bible said they just beat them good and sent them out. And said, don't preach no more. And Peter told them, said, whether you think it's right with God to obey you or him. He said, you can figure that out. He said, but we're going to preach God. We're going to, we're going to do what we've, said, what we've seen. We're going to tell. And we're just going to keep preaching it. And they did. And the Bible said when they left there, they were rejoicing. Yes. 
Now, I don't believe that was just inherent in their nature, right? We learn enough about Peter and John, or at least James and John, the sons of thunder, right? They were ready to call down fire upon poor people that, that, that didn't line up with Christ. And here we have them being beaten. And when they're sent out, they're thanking God. They're praising him. They're rejoicing in their spirit. And I have to believe in my heart that what happened to them was the very moment that they experienced the persecution, that they experienced the pummeling of their own bodies, the hurting of their own self, that there was something greater in them that rose up and began to supply to them a joy and a fullness that they had never experienced before. And they were able to leave that place bleeding and bruised may be broken with their hands extended saying thank you God Amen. I've never experienced that so I'm only I'm only assuming by the scripture that what happened to these men was when they actually experienced a suffering condition for the cause of Jesus Christ that God the Father honored what he said he would do and they rejoiced in the middle of it what an extraordinary thing to think that in our hardest, the most challenging, the time when our flesh may in every way want to respond in opposition or retaliation or revenge, and yet these men walked out of there more confident than they had ever been before because they had suffered. The Holy Spirit of God was not absent when they suffered, but present. When the Spirit of God raised up in them, they left that place rejoicing. It's not the only time. Multiple times we find this same occurrence in Scripture. We find Paul and Silas, right? We remember when they were in Philippi locked in the jail, right? Having been beaten, right? Again, strapped to the walls in that inner prison. And yet what the Bible said was, they were praying and singing. What a foreign thought to us, right? It is absolutely a mystery to you and I how somebody having just been beaten can be worshiping God. I'm telling you the phenomena is is linked directly to what he said. When we are reviled for the sake of Jesus Christ, when we are falsely accused or lied about by the, for the cause of Christ, when we suffer persecution for the namesake of Jesus Christ, what he is promising is there will be a power there, there will be a blessing there that you cannot deny, you cannot walk around, you will experience it in its fullness and you will know the blessing of persecution then. These other things have nothing to do with resisting under blood. And yet what we find in persecution is that it may come to that. Now, in the Hebrews, when the Apostle Paul wrote in the 12th chapter to them, he was very clear about that. He said, look, he said, you've not resisted yet unto blood, striving against sin. Now, he had, right? He had certainly been to that place. I remember as he wrote concerning the afflictions of persecution he had suffered, the, the horrendous things that he went through, and yet we find, <laughs> we find the Apostle Paul always preaching Christ. We find him always filled with a hopefulness and a willingness and a longing to help others and to see Christ exalted. This is the man to whom they stoned and left for dead one time. And he gets up from there and he dusts himself off, bruised on every part of his body and rejoices as he goes to the next place knowing that it could all happen again. Amen. Absolute foreign thought to you and I because we've never experienced persecution as they did. In the time that the epistles were written in the early church, Nero, the madman, Nero Caesar reigned and in that day they would they would take Christians and for sport right they would they would herd up 10 or 15 or 20 of them at the bottom of the arena and 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 as they worked up the crowd and got everybody into a frenzy they would 
they would force them, them Christians right out there into the middle of the thing and then open the gates and let the lions come out. And the lions would come out and, and would maul them and, and, and kill them. And people cheered. Right? Read your history books. Cheered as they watched humans being devoured by lions just because they were Christian. And yet time and time again, we find those historical documents where people walked into there and though their flesh may have feared, there was a resolve in their heart because they were not willing to renounce Christ. Over and over you can find in the Fox Books of Martyrs, you can read about many, many, many people who died because they would not denounce Christ. They would not detach themselves from Jesus. They would not deny their affiliation with Christ. They would not, would not let go and died for it. Suffered, immensely tortured, and never, never, Gave up. You say, where in the world does that strength come from? Christ alone. Amen. What I'm saying to you today is that blessed, when he said blessed are the persecuted, this is one of the grandest promises that he's ever made. What he is saying to you and I is though we may, though we may not know it, there are people that are persecuted and when he says they are fully blessed, I believe that's exactly what he meant. Nero would take Christians when they had them, because they certainly believed that Jesus was king, Nero would take them and if they wouldn't renounce Christ or their belief in Jesus Christ, they would dig a pit in the sand along the street. They would bury their bodies up to here, and pour wax over the top part of their body and pitch, and then they would light them on fire and burn them alive. All they had to do was say, I don't love Jesus. I don't serve Christ. Right. All they had to do is say, Jesus is not Lord. That's all they had to do. And they burned him. You say, where in the world does the fortitude and the grace come to stand when you know in 10 seconds you're going to be lit afire if you don't renounce Christ? Where does that strength come from? Hear me, this is the grandest of promises you'll ever see. What he said was, is blessed are you when this happens. What did he mean? Listen to me. In verse number 12, he comes and he says, for great is your reward in heaven. Oh, great. As with every one of the Beatitudes, there were, there were promises that was linked to now and promises that was linked to eternity. And when we think about... What God has promised concerning persecution. Let me see if I can paint a picture for you. <laughs> when God the Father thinks of the Son, he boomed and he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I tell you, know this, that there is nothing greater than the name of Jesus Christ to Jehovah God. <laughs> And to those who will stand for the name of Jesus Christ, know this, Jehovah God is on your side. And regardless of whether he chooses to deliver you or you will be delivered to the persecution, regardless of what takes place, here's what I can promise you will happen. He will not leave you. For the sake of his beloved son, he will bless you. In the midst of your suffering, he will bless you. What you will find is in persecution, there will be pain, there will be suffering, right? It's not persecution apart from the suffering, the grievousness, the affliction, the verbal abuse, the slandering, the false accusations, whatever it may be. Those things will hurt. Those will have their effect to the flesh and to the, to the body and to the mind. But what God is promising what Jesus is promising is that when those things occur, the Father himself, for the sake of the Son, will support you and me. 
There will be a spirit, the spirit of God that is within us will rise up to the occasion. Why? Because the Father will always honor the Son. And for those that stand for Jesus Christ, it may cost you. It does cost people today. To those precious Christians in communist China who have hidden for years. They keep going. They keep meeting. They keep worshiping. They keep praying. And when they get caught, do they renounce Christ? They do not. Where does that strength come from? You say, I don't know if I can do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can do it. You see, because at the moment that you have to decide, there'll be something greater in you. There'll be something rise up in you. The Holy Spirit of God who honors the Son, the Jehovah God himself, who honors his beloved Son. If you're standing for Jesus Christ, you will experience the glory of being blessed by God. Oh, the blessing that comes. We can't see this, right? We stand on the outside of this one looking in. Because to this point in our lives, we have not experienced such persecution as goes on in the rest of the world. To the Christians in those Arab nations where the hostility is violent, right? It's not just verbal or they're not just going to take your assets and send you to a dark place. No. No, their desire is to, to behead you on YouTube. Right, So all the world can see what happens to the infidels that don't worship their God. Let me be clear. Those people stood for Christ. And in their time of greatest need, I can assure you, he was there. He was there. Wasn't his will to save them? He saved some, some he didn't. In that sense. To some, he just brings them on home. Right? An instant entry into heaven. Right? We, we tremble at the thought of these things. But may I say to you today, there are people that are exposed to this kind of persecution every day of their life. Why? Because they chose to follow Jesus Christ. And they do it with joy. They don't walk around with their heads down. Oh, I'm persecuted. No, their hands are up as they worship and thank God. What Peter and John, what it said about Peter and John was that they, they, they praised God because they had been found willing, they had been found worthy to suffer. There will be an experience of complete and total fullness. A satisfaction that can only come by the Holy Spirit's working in us in such a circumstance or situation. I'm fully convinced that folks go through that. You can read about the testimony of the martyrs and so many others that have gone through. And they were simply unwilling to renounce Christ. No matter what the cost, no matter what it did, they wouldn't. And I believe they experienced the greatest, the fullness of his satisfaction inside of them. That's the now. But what about eternity? What about the promise he made? Blessed are those that are persecuted. In verse number 12 where he said, For great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Let me be clear about this. <clears throat> I'm not saying I have this reward in heaven. Again, I said this. I'm in the back of the bus on this one. And everybody in front of me, <laughs> thank God for them. Absolutely. They were faithful unto the end. When they suffered, they never gave up. They never laid down the cross. They never renounced Christ. They never threw in the towel. They never, they never stopped. They continued to worship Christ. They continued to follow him regardless of the cost. And according to the scripture, in eternity, great is their reward. Let me say this. When it comes to being rewarded for having suffered for the sake of Jesus Christ, I can assure you there will be no greater reward than that. And I fear I have none of it. 
I don't know that I have any reward for having suffered for Christ. If I'd have been, if I'd have been born to a China, somebody in China, maybe. I don't know that I have any of that reward. <laughs> but you know what I say to that? Give it to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. They stood. Some of them died. But they all suffered. They did for the sake of Christ. Honor them. Give them the reward. And great that reward will be. Think about that. Throughout all of eternity, they will have received the greatest of reward because they were willing to suffer for Christ. Let me close with this. I believe part of the problem in, in, the, in the post-Christian era that we live in the wickedness that's rampant all around us is because the church has sat down. And one of the reasons that the American church is so weak is because it does not suffer. It is not tried. It is not tested. And therefore, is not strong. Suffering makes us strong. We want to claim all of those things in life that are hard as having suffered for Christ, but no offense to anybody that's had cancer, but everybody gets cancer. Right? You don't get cancer because you do or don't love Jesus. Right? So don't put that one in the box. Lost people get cancer. Right? This is about suffering for the name of Jesus Christ or for having stood on what he declares to be right. And in this country, at least at this point, We're protected from such persecution, which I'm grateful for. Don't get me wrong. And I'll continue to defend that and the need for it as long as I have an opportunity to do so. But I'll also say that it is the lack of suffering, the lack of persecution that creates such a, a, a laziness and a brokenness in a church that should be strong. If there was any church that should be vibrant and full and active and worshiping and powerful, it ought to be that church that has religious freedoms defended. But are we? Look, look around you people. Look around you. The benches are empty. You cannot tell me that we are we're swimming in the strength of our spiritual rightness. But persecution will purge that church. Persecution will figure out who will stay and who will go. Would it not? Yes. Persecution will determine who is on his side while the others run. Persecution will do that. Persecution would purge the church, and it will make us stronger. Why? Because I can assure you, when persecution and reviling and slandering and all of this comes, guess what you're going to be doing? You'll be praying. You'll be praying and praying and praying. What you should be doing now, you will be doing then. And that will make you stronger. It'll make the church stronger. It'll make our witness stronger. It'll make our effectiveness with the law stronger. All right, you get it. There's not a person 
in the room that would say, boy, I hope we start getting persecuted tomorrow. I know that. And I'm, I'm right there with you. Thank you, God, that I live in a country where I am free to worship. I thank God for that. One of the greatest attempts in human civilization was to create a government based upon democracy that stood for human rights. But what we found after 200 years is that even that democracy can be corrupted. Yes. And that if we allow sin to rule in our culture, it isn't a government that will save us. It will have to be a God. So I say to you today, I'm not a prophet. I don't have a, I don't have a crystal ball. But I can tell you this, persecution's coming. Whether we have laws or don't have laws, persecution is coming. I don't know how else God will purge the church. But he will purge her. He will get her right. It's his. Do whatever he wants to do. However he wants to do it. And by the grace of God, hear me, by the grace of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit that abides within me, I'm going to stand. And if they beat us and lock us in the jail, I'm quite sure I won't be alone. Because I cannot denounce Christ. I cannot deny him. I cannot tell you that what he said is a lie. If he said it's wrong, it's wrong. And if that means I have to suffer, to God be all the glory. Blessed are they that are persecuted. Oh, what a promise. What a promise, what a glorious truth that Christ has made to those who will not back up. There will be the Holy Spirit when we need it. will be there. We have example over and over in the Scripture where the Holy Spirit stood when they couldn't stand, when they had been beaten and broken and feared for their lives in every circumstance, Christ and his spirit blessed them. Right? These people rejoiced. Come get a song. These people rejoiced when it happened. Explain that to me. There's no other explanation when they were beaten, when they were reviled, when they were persecuted, they rejoiced. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, he said, Rejoice and be exceeding glad when men shall do this to you. We don't get it, do we? It's a mystery to us. But it's nonetheless true. We have example and example of the persecuted church in Scripture. We have historical information throughout the annals of time that give us the same report that Christians weren't down. <laughs> oh, they rejoiced. How did they rejoice? Because the promise of Jesus Christ will never, ever fail. If he said, you will be blessed if he said, rejoice and be exceeding glad when these things happen, that's exactly what he meant. And he intends in every way to fulfill his promise in making it so. You may suffer. We may suffer. 
We may experience persecution, but we will not experience it without Christ. We have a promise of God, and the sun will darken before that promise fails, you and me. When I need grace to stand and say, no, I will not recount. No, I will not. There will be grace. Amen. (laughs) Heavy stuff, wasn't it? Well, you read any of the Fox's Book of Martyrs? Most troubling reading. But it But it pulls me into the, the truth that when it comes right down to it for the child of God, you may think in your fleshly mind, I, 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 I don't know what I would do if they had one of my children and they were going to kill my child if I didn't renounce Christ. I don't know what I would. I know what you'll do. When that moment comes, there will be Grace. That exceeds your wildest comprehension. There will be a fortitude and a peace. That will fill your soul. As a river fills a thimble. It will push its way. To the top. As the spirit of God. Rejoices in Christ. You cannot. Recount Christ. Martin Luther, when he took a stand, has everybody read about the the Great Reformation? Martin Luther, his 95 Theses, when he was opposing the Catholic Church and the horrific wickedness that was going on in the Catholic Church, and he had been enlightened in the Scripture, and he he basically, he had 95 things, and he he wrote them all down, and he, he went to the door of the church, and he nailed it on the door. When they brought him into him, they they all brought him in and said, you know, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to denounce everything that you've done. You're gonna He basically said to them, I cannot. I will not. He said, I put my hands in or he said, I put myself in in the hand of God, and so be it. We can't. Can't go back. I believe there'll be grace for every situation. Let me ask you to pray for those that are persecuted today. We may not be there yet, but there are people in this world that are persecuted every single day for the name of your Savior. They suffer for Him. Some of them die. They do so for the name of Jesus Christ. And you know what? I honor them. I give them the reward, Lord. (laughs) They've earned it. I've not. They've earned it. Let them have it. Give it to them. Because when it comes our time, if we suffer, if this country gets to that place where we have no more rule, where we have no more defense for our right to worship God as we choose, then we need to go ahead and make up our minds, right? Now's the time to decide. And I intend on teaching my grandchildren this. For no reason do we back up on God. No reason. No matter the cost makes no difference. You got to teach this. This is important because it's coming. Needn't be a surprise to our people. It's coming. But I've got all I need right now. He's in here. Everything that I need, He's right there. He won't fail us. Stand as we sing. Mm-hmm.